Hey there guys, this is Richard, your host. Do you guys remember the iconic Nintendo GameCube? Believe it or not, it just turned over 20. Let's pause for a moment to let that sink in. Hmm, feeling old yet? Hmm? Now, you might be thinking, GameCube? Wasn't that the system that struggled with sales, sitting above only the Wii U in Nintendo's home console lineup? And yeah, you'd be right. With 22 million units sold, it wasn't exactly the champion of its era, especially next to the DVD-equipped giants like the PS2. But, and here's the big but, the GameCube held secret power. Despite its cutesy look and its library of discs that looked like they were shrunk in the wash, the GameCube was home to some of the most innovative, beautiful, and downright unforgettable gaming experiences Nintendo ever conjured up. It was a purple powerhouse that proved size and sales isn't everything. Forget about its supposed shortcomings for a moment. This console brought us masterpieces like Wind Waker and Resident Evil 4, games that remain etched in our hearts to this day. And that's not even mentioning the legendary controller that felt like it was made specifically for your hands or the adorable startup screen that greeted us every time we powered on. But here's the real deal. Amidst its celebrated titles, there are gems, brilliant games that flew under the radar, waiting for their moment in the spotlight. That's where we come in. Today, we're counting down the top 37 Overlook GameCube exclusive games begging for a revival. These are the titles that deserve a second chance, a new life on modern consoles, proving once and for all that the GameCube isn't just Nintendo's most underappreciated console, it's also a treasure trove of gaming excellence. So, so in today's episode, we'll explore top 37 GameCube exclusives that you might have missed. Let's go! Super Smash Bros. Melee. Starting with Super Smash Bros. Melee, which is like a celebration of Nintendo's history, a cornerstone of gaming culture, and a statement to what makes video games so darn fun. Plot? No, <laughs> more like a mashup of epic proportions. So, Melee isn't your typical game with a story where you follow a hero on a quest. It's like someone threw a huge party and all the Nintendo stars crashed it. You've got everyone from Mario to Link, and even characters from Fire Emblem showing up, making fans outside Japan go, who? It's basically the ultimate Nintendo crossover where the plot takes a backseat to pure, unadulterated fan service. The gameplay here is like where chaos meets strategy. This game really flipped the script on fighting games. Instead of chipping away at a health bar, you're trying to launch your opponents off the screen like they're on a one-way trip to the moon. The damage meter cranks up the suspense. The higher it gets, the easier it is to send someone flying. What's killer is the simplicity. No need to memorize combo moves. Just smash buttons and direct your joystick to unleash havoc. The variety of items and stages straight out of your favorite Nintendo games is just icing on the cake. Critics and gamers lost their minds over Melee. It's like the game could do no wrong. The graphics were a step up, the soundtrack was like a symphony of nostalgia, and the gameplay was tighter than your jeans after Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> sure, some nitpicks about the hyperspeed gameplay and the learning curve, but when you've got a game this good, who's complaining? With over 7 million copies sold, it wasn't just a hit, it was a phenomenon. Mario Kart Double Dash Next up, we have Mario Kart Double Dash. Like we're just hanging out and chatting about one of the most unique entries in the Mario Kart series. I mean, who doesn't know the plot here? It's racing, but Mario style. Think of it as the Mario crew and friends, and the bad guys deciding to throw down in the wackiest racing tournament ever. What sets this game apart is the duo dynamic. Every kart's got a driver and an item lobber. It's like Mario Party on wheels, but with speed, shells, and bananas. The gameplay here makes the game double the fun. You're not just racing, you're strategy with your buddy in real time. One of you steers through those wild themed tracks, while the other unleashes item mayhem on your rivals. Switch roles on the fly to mix it up or play to your strengths. The co-op gameplay adds a whole layer of camaraderie or rivalry if you're feeling spicy. And let's not forget the all-out warfare in multiplayer modes. Whether you're battling it out in arenas or racing up to 16 players via LAN, Double Dash brings the party to your living room. It's chaotic, it's frantic, and it's a blast. Critics and fans alike went bananas. And I'm not kidding when I say that everyone loved this fresh take on the Mario Kart formula, lauding the graphics, track designs, and especially the dual character mechanics. Though the voice acting got some flack, looking at you, overly enthusiastic toad, the game was a hit, selling millions and cementing its place as a GameCube classic. It's like, well, despite any minor gripes, everyone couldn't help but get sucked into the frenzy that Double Dash delivered. You know what sets this apart? The two riders per kart mechanic. It's not just a gimmick. It changes the whole vibe of the game. Racing with a friend or frenemy had strategy and depth, turning each race into a dynamic duo adventure. Plus, this game's got personality for days, from the carts and characters to the lively creative tracks. The 
Legend of Zelda Four Swords Adventures. The Legend of Zelda Four Swords Adventures is basically like Hyrule's chilling in peace and then boom, Shadow Link pops up out of nowhere, causing mayhem. Classic Zelda vibe. Princess Zelda and the Shrine Maidens are like, Link, help us out! So our boy pulls the four sword and bam, he split into four. Mm. The gang's all here, green, red, blue and purple Link, ready to save the day. Their mission? Restore peace, beat Shadow Link, tackle Varty again, yeah, he's back, and uncover the real big bad, Ganon, with a dark trident causing chaos. It's a wild ride across Hyrule to save the maidens, collect force gems and put the baddies back in their place. The game's got this cool Hyrulean adventure mode where you and up to three pals, or just you and some AI buddies, go on a quest across eight worlds, solving puzzles, battling bosses, and collecting gems. The catch? Well, you're doing it all as a team of Lynx, which is hilarious and chaotic. You can play on a GameCube, but if you want the full experience, you'll grab your Game Boy Advances and connect them for some insane cooperative play. There's also a shadow battle mode for when you feel like duking it out with your friends instead of cooperating. And you know what? People were into it, man. Nintendo Power threw it into their top 50 Nintendo games, and Metacritic gave it an 86 out of 100. Reviewers were all about the multiplayer action, the throwback graphics that mixed old-school Zelda with the Wind Waker vibes, and how it used the GBA for some unique gameplay twists. Though it was a hit, some folks were a bit miffed about needing a GBA and a link cable to get the full experience. Super Mario Sunshine, Mario Peach, Toadsworth and a bunch of toads are all set for a chill vacation on the tropical Isle Delfino. But as soon as they land, they're greeted not by sunshine and cocktails, but by goop, graffiti and a warrant for Mario's arrest. Thanks to a Mario lookalike, aka Shadow Mario, the island's a mess and the shine sprites that power Delfino have vanished. Spoiler, mm, it's actually Bowser Jr. Mario's holiday turns into a community service stint, armed with a high-tech water cannon backpack named Flood to clean up the island, recover the shine sprites and rescue Peach from the clutches of his imposter. Super Mario Sunshine takes the exploration and 3D platforming of Super Mario 64 and splashes in a whole new layer of fun with Flood. This handy device lets Mario spray water to clean up sludge, attack enemies, hover in the air, rocket jump and even dash at super speeds. The game revolves around collecting shine sprites to brighten up the island and uncover new areas, alongside snagging blue coins for extra shines. And let's not forget Yoshi, making a comeback with his juice-spitting and fruit-eating antics. Everyone was all over Super Mario Mario Sunshine like sand on a beach towel, the innovative gameplay with Flood, the story and that island vibe soundtrack. However, some weren't fans of the camera angles, found Flood a bit gimmicky and thought the game could be frustratingly tough. And let's not even dive into the mixed feelings about the voice acting. Uh -uh. Despite that, it sold like hotcakes, becoming one of the GameCube's top sellers and even getting a re-release for the Switch in 2020. Metroid Prime Metroid Prime is another game that took Samus Aran into the realm of 3D and first-person adventuring like it was no big deal. So, Samus is doing her usual galaxy-saving gig when she picks up a distress signal from a space pirate frigate classic Tuesday. Things go sideways fast. She battles parasites, encounters a souped-up Ridley, and loses some of her gear in the chaos. Chasing Ridley, she lands on Talon 4, where things get really interesting. Turns out, the space pirates are messing around with a substance called Phazon, which is bad news all around. Samus's mission? Uncover the secrets of Phazon, deal with the space pirates, and stop whatever crazy plan they've got brewing. Calling Metroid Prime a first-person shooter is like calling a Swiss army knife a toothpick. Sure, yeah, they're shooting, but the game's all about exploration, solving puzzles and soaking in the eerie vibes of Talon 4. You've got the whole arsenal, from the classic morph ball to new gadgets that let Samus navigate through heat, poison, and the vacuum of space. The game cleverly mixes first-person action with moments where you'll see Samus in third person, especially when rolling around as a morph ball. Gamers and critics alike were honestly just blown away. The game snagged Game of the Year awards left and right, and earned a spot in the best games of all time conversation. Sales? Through the roof. Sequels? <laughs> you bet. Echoes. Corruption. And a long-awaited Metroid Prime 4 on the horizon. The attention to detail in the game is nuts, like you can see raindrops on Samus's visor, and the soundtrack. <laughs> Hauntingly perfect. It's this combo of immersive gameplay and atmospheric storytelling that not only stayed true to the Metroid spirit, but also brought it into a whole new dimension.
Paper Mario, The Thousand Year Door. Mario and Princess Peach are all set for some treasure hunting fun when Peach gets snatched up by these alien goons called the x -Nauts. Turns out, they're after the same legendary loot hidden behind the mystical Thousand Year Door in Rogueport. Mario's mission? Crack open that door, nab the treasure, and save Peach, all while navigating a world that looks like it just popped out of a storybook. This isn't your run-of-the-mill Mario game. It's a whole RPG shebang with a unique twist. Everything's made of paper. Mario flips, folds, and slides his way through puzzles and battles in a papercraft world. The combat? It's turn-based with a timing element that keeps you on your toes. You'll be hopping on heads and swinging hammers, but nail the timing and you'll dish out extra damage or dodge attacks. Mario isn't flying solo either. He's got a posse of partners, each with their own skills for solving puzzles and fighting foes. And these aren't your average Mario sidekicks. We're talking a Goomba with sass, a Koopa with anxiety, and even a baby Yoshi you get to name. Each brings something special to the table, both in and out of battles. The game critics? <laughs> they ate it up, praised for its witty story, super cool gameplay, and that irresistible paper aesthetic. The Thousand Year Door snagged awards and is often hailed as the peak of the Paper Mario series. It's like everyone suddenly remembered how much fun it is to read. If reading involved jumping on Goombas and solving the mysteries of an ancient paper-crafted world, what's so special? Well, Mario transforms into a paper aeroplane or a boat, slipping through cracks or floating on breezes. It's a mechanic that shapes how you explore and interact with the world. And the writing? Oh, chef's kiss. Mwah! It's clever, funny, and doesn't shy away from throwing Mario into situations that are downright bizarre. Ever wanted to see Mario become a pro wrestler? Hmm, this game's got you covered. Fire Emblem Path of Radiance Fire Emblem Path of Radiance is where the Fire Emblem series really starts to flex on the GameCube, bringing all that tactical RPG goodness into the 3D world for the first time. This is both a chess and a fantasy epic, where every move could mean life or death for your characters. So there's this continent called Tellius, split between humans, aka Bayork, and shapeshifters, aka Lagoose. Things hit the fan when Dane invades Crimea, and our boy Ike, a rough around the edges mercenary, finds himself on a mission to restore Crimea. Mia's princess, Alincia, back to the throne. But it's not just about battles and glory. There's a deeper narrative about racial tension, long-held grudges, and the quest for peace. It's got all the makings of a fantasy epic betrayal, lost royalty, and a sinister force lurking behind the scenes. If you've played Fire Emblem before, you know the drill. Turn-based battles where you move your units around a grid, kinda like chess but with magic, swords, and dragons. Except if you slip up and a character falls in battle, they're gone. Poof! <laughs> no coming back. Makes every skirmish a pulse-pounding affair. Ike's your main man, but if he bites the dust, it's game over, so you gotta play it smart. You'll manage a diverse crew, from hard-hitting Bayork to mighty shape-shifting Lagoose, each bringing their own flair to the fight. Characters transform into beasts, adding a whole layer of strategy. And let's talk about progression. Characters level up, gain new skills, and can even change classes, getting stronger and learning flashy new moves. Upon release, Path of Radiance was praised for bringing depth and nuance to both its gameplay and storytelling. While the transition to 3D was a big leap, it wasn't without its hiccups. Graphics were a mixed bag, according to some. But what really stood out was the rich, engaging plot and the strategic depth that kept players coming back for just one more turn. F-Zero GX F-Zero GX is the adrenaline-pumping future of racing games, packed into a GameCube disc. In a galaxy not too far away, where racing is as much about survival as it is about speed, Captain Falcon stands as a beacon of hope and fastness. F-Zero GX brings a narrative twist with its story mode, letting you dive deep into Captain Falcon's world. You're not just racing, you're battling gangs, dodging boulders, and even escaping from collapsing buildings. Coming to the gameplay now, racing on tracks that twist, turn, and sometimes even loop in ways that defy gravity you need to have your wits about you. The game demands you memorize each twist and turn of its tracks, push your reflexes to the limit, and make split-second decisions that could mean the difference between victory and a spectacular wipeout. The game offers a buffet of futuristic races, each with unique stats and handling, challenging you to find the perfect match for your racing style. And with the ability to tweak your vehicle's balance between acceleration and top speed before each race, F-Zero GX gives you the tools to edge out the competition if you're skilled enough to use them. Hmm. People couldn't get enough of its breakneck speed eye-popping visuals and pulse-pounding tracks. Though its steep difficulty curve might have thrown some for a loop, it's this challenge that has earned it a spot in the hearts of hardcore racers and made it a cult classic. Sure, the graphics received some mixed reviews, but when you're flying at Mach 5, who has time to nitpick?
Metal Gear Solid The Twin Snakes Metal Gear Solid The Twin Snakes offers shinier graphics, cinematic flair straight out of a Hollywood blockbuster, and gameplay slicker than a wet otter. That's what this game is for you. So, you're Solid Snake, a one-man army with a penchant for stealth and a mullet that defies logic. You're tasked with infiltrating a nuclear facility to neutralize a terrorist threat and save the world from a nuclear standoff. Classic Tuesday. Only, there's a twist. Your foes are led by your clone brother, Liquid Snake. It's a tale of betrayal, hidden identities, and gigantic walking tanks capable of launching nukes. If soap operas had tanks and stealth camo, they'd be this game. The Twin Snakes pulls the best bits from Metal Gear Solid 2, Sons of Liberty, and marries them with the original game's DNA. You've got first-person shooting, enemies that actually have a sense of sight and hearing, and the ability to hang from ledges. Ever wanted to feel like Spider-Man in a military base? Well, this is your chance. The game doesn't just challenge you to sneak and fight your way through, it demands mastery. Each encounter is a puzzle, with soldiers and cameras as the pieces. And those boss fights? Yeah, they're like epic set pieces straight out of an action movie, complete with dramatic monologues and revelations that'll have you questioning your sanity. The addition of Sons of Liberty mechanics means you've got more ways to tackle them, but so do they. Expect to be challenged, outsmarted, and occasionally frustrated. Whether you're here for the stealth, the story, or just to see Snake backflip off a missile, the Twin Snakes delivers an unforgettable ride. Copy that, boss. We're going after the fighters. Star Wars Rogue Squadron 2 – Rogue Leader In this next game, you're stepping into the boots of either Luke Skywalker or Wedge Antilles, smack in the middle of the original Star Wars trilogy chaos. Rogue Leader is a dream come true for fans, taking you through ten nail-biting missions across the galaxy. You're fighting the good fight with the Rebel Alliance against the Galactic Empire, reenacting iconic battles and sneaking around enemy lines. From blowing up the Death Star to the icy plains of Hoth and the epic space battle of Endor, it's like living through your favorite movie moments. This game is like you action-packed space opera, but you're in the pilot seat. You get to fly various iconic Star Wars crafts, each with their quirks and arsenal. Missions range from search and destroy to escorting and defending, keeping you on your toes. There's this cool Command Cross feature that lets you issue commands to your wingmen, adding a nice tactical layer. The game has got a solid mix of objectives, with some levels even letting you switch ships mid-mission. And for the completionists out there, the medal system adds a sweet replay value, challenging you to ace each mission for those shiny rewards and unlockables, like piloting the Millennium Falcon or, huh, get this, flipping the script to fight against the Rebels as Darth Vader. Critics and fans alike went bananas over Rogue Leader. The graphics and sound were top-notch, really immersing players in the Star Wars universe like never before. The gameplay also received heaps of praise for its intensity and variety. However, some folks were bummed out about the absence of multiplayer, feeling a game this cool deserved to be shared in real-time dogfights with friends. Almost as if reliving your favorite Star Wars moments but with you in the cockpit, making those split-second decisions that decide the fate of the galaxy. Pretty epic, if you ask me. Star Fox Adventures Here we have Star Fox Adventures, and trust me, it's a journey. Eight years have zoomed past since the Star Fox crew dealt with Andros, and now Fox McCloud lands on Dinosaur Planet, aka Soria, in the sequels to stop its impending doom. The place is crawling with dinos and other prehistoric creatures, ruled by tribes and plagued by the tyrannical General Scales. Fox, initially arriving unarmed, ends up wielding a magical star found on the planet. Oh, and there's Crystal, the mysterious blue fox, caught in a crystal. <laughs> Pun absolutely intended, because of of some Krizoa spirit shenanigans. And yes, Andros is behind it all, again, aiming for galaxy domination. Coming to the gameplay now. So, you've got two main flavors here, Adventure Mode and R-Wing Mode. Adventure Mode feels like you're playing a Zelda game with a Star Fox twist. You're exploring, solving puzzles, buying stuff with scarabs, and your health looks like little fox heads. Huh. The combat, it's mostly melee, with some magic staff action for both popping enemies and solving puzzles. Then there's R-Wing Mode, which is your classic Star Fox flying and shooting, darting through gold rings and dodging obstacles. It's of no surprise that people dug it, huh, for the most part. The visuals, oh, downright stunning. Fox and the gang never looked better, and the detailed environments were a treat. But not everyone was thrilled about the voice acting, or the game taking a detour from the traditional Star Fox gameplay into Zelda territory. Mm. Still, it sold like hotcakes, and even got slapped with the Player's Choice label for moving so many copies. Orders. Attack their fighters! I'm on the ties.
Star Wars Rogue Squadron 3 Rebel Strike Star Wars Rogue Squadron 3 Rebel Strike as you're stepping into the roles of Luke Skywalker and Wedge Antilles, leading the charge against the Galactic Empire with Rogue Squadron. The story kicks off right after the iconic Death Star goes boom above Yavin 4. The Empire isn't having it, pushing the Alliance to scurry for a new base. The narrative takes us on a wild ride from there, featuring defections, daring rescues, and even a betrayal within Rogue Squadron. Fast forward a bit, and we're smashing through the Battle of Hoth, leading raids and ultimately partaking in the Grand Showdown over Endor. There's a real sense of galaxy-spanning adventure with high stakes and familiar faces. Gameplay-wise, Rebel Strike shook up the formula by letting players jump out of their starfighters for some on-foot action. This meant not just piloting X-Wings and ATSTs, but also running around blasting stormtroopers face to face. Besides these ground missions, you've got the classic space battles that define the series, plus some sweet vehicle theft missions. The multiplayer modes were a neat addition, letting you and a friend team up or face off in various ships across different scenarios. Overall, the game landed pretty well with fans and critics. The expanded gameplay with more enemies and the options for ground combat were big hits. That said, not everything was smooth flying. The on-foot sections caught some flack for feeling a bit awkward and unpolished, which was a bit of a letdown for players excited about running around as their favorite Star Wars heroes. The multiplayer aspect, especially the co-op missions from Rogue Leader, added a whole new layer of fun, making it a game that tried to give Star Wars fans everything they could want. It's a bold chapter in the series that aimed to deliver an all-encompassing Star Wars adventure. Pokemon Colosseum It's Pokemon's world and we're just living in it. Step into the shoes of Wes, a dude who's basically the Robin Hood of the Pokemon world. Wes is a former bad guy turned good, busting out of Team Snagum with a high-tech device that can snag Pokemon from other trainers. Why? Because these aren't just any Pokemon. They're Shadow Pokemon, twisted by the evil Team Cypher to be used as tools for domination. Wes, alongside Rui, a girl who can spot these Shadow Pokemon by the eerie aura they emit, sets off on a mission across the Ore region. This place Place is a desert wasteland, starkly different from the lush regions we're used to, with no wild Pokemon to catch. Their goal? To save these Pokemon from their dark fates, purify their hearts, and take down the baddies in the process. Breaking away from the traditional Pokemon formula, Colosseum is a full-on RPG adventure set in 3D. Instead of wandering grassy fields for random Pokemon encounters, you're snagging shadow Pokemon directly from other trainers in double battles. These battles are intense, requiring you to strategize not just about winning, but also about snagging these corrupt Pokemon to save them. Purifying these Pokemon is a big part of the game, healing their hearts and unlocking their true potential. Plus, there's a mix of exploration, battling in Colosseums for glory, and connecting with Game Boy Advance titles to trade Pokemon back and forth. And let's not forget the multiplayer modes, where you can duke it out with friends or team up for some cooperative action. It was a commercial hit too, selling over a million copies in the US alone. The shift to a more narrative-driven 3D RPG format was largely praised, offering a fresh take on the Pokemon universe. However, it wasn't all roses. Some found the on-foot sections a bit clunky and missed the wild Pokemon encounters of previous games. But the unique concept of purifying Shadow Pokemon and the overall gameplay innovation were seen as big pluses. And despite the mixed reviews on graphics and sound, its bold narrative and gameplay choices made it a memorable entry in the Pokemon saga, setting the stage for its sequel and leaving a lasting impact on fans. Mario Party 4 Mario Party dropped back in 2002 for the GameCube, making it the first in the series to grace the console. In the game, Mario and Cole get sucked into this wild board game universe where they're chasing after stars, duking it out in minigames and trying to outsmart each other, and sometimes the game itself. It's less about an epic saga and more about the chaos of competing with your friends across themed boards like a casino run by Goomba or a beach party courtesy of Koopa. The heart of Mario Party 4 lies in rolling dice to move across the board, snagging coins and jumping into a wild variety of minigames at the end of each round. These minigames are the real meat, ranging from free-for-alls to 1v3 showdowns, each with simple controls but tons of strategy and chaos. Winning nets you coins, which you need to buy stars, the real MVPs of victory. Boards are sprinkled with special events and spaces that can either make your day or totally ruin your strategy. And let's not forget about the items that can really shake things up, like swapping positions or growing giant to stomp over your opponents. But this time, critics had mixed feelings. They dug the minigames games and the multiplayer vibes but weren't thrilled about what they saw as a lack of fresh ideas or the game dragging at times. Despite that, it managed to get the Family Game of the Year award in 2000.
2003, so it definitely did something right. Sales were solid, proving Mario and Party games go together like peanut butter and jelly. To sum it up, Mario Party 4 represents the chaotic heart of party games, where strategy, luck and outright sabotage come together for some unforgettable game nights. Kirby Air Ride Developed by HAL Laboratory and hitting the GameCube scene in 2003, Kirby Air Ride was a bit of a roller coaster before it even launched, bouncing around from the N64 days before finally finding its home. Kirby Air Ride says see ya to complicated controls. You've got your stick to steer and one button to rule them all, sucking in enemies, braking and boosting. There's a sweet mix of strategy with gliding, and you're not just racing, you're also battling it out with abilities you snag from enemies. It's split into three modes. Air Ride, which is your classic race to the finish, Top Ride, think old school top down racing but with Kirby Charm, and City Trial, which is a battle royale scavenger hunt for machine upgrades before facing a final challenge. Each mode is spiced up with a checklist system that's like a bingo card of objectives to hit, unlocking new rides and goodies as you go. Despite the game getting mixed reviews for being too simple or similar to other races out there, it's still sold like hotcakes, with over 1.2 million copies finding their homes worldwide. Critics were torn, and players loved diving into its unique modes, especially the chaotic fun of City Trial. What really makes Kirby Air Ride stand out isn't just the Kirby-fied racing action but how he flipped the script on traditional racing mechanics. Plus, City Trial was this unexpected gem, mixing free exploration with intense competition, something you didn't see in racing games back then. Mario Golf Toadstool Tour Mario Golf Toadstool Tour is like if Mario and the gang decided to take a break from saving princesses to hit the links, and it's a total blast. Developed by Camelot Software and hitting the GameCube in 2003, it's the sequel to the N64 version, bringing everyone's favorite Mushroom Kingdom characters to the green in glorious 3D. The game's pretty straightforward for a golf game, but with that classic Mario twist. You pick from 16 characters, each rocking their own golfing stats, and swing your way through tournaments to unlock cool new stuff. There's no need to worry about complex controls. It's all about choosing the right club, setting up your shot, and then timing your swing with a simple button press. You can even add spin to your ball to outsmart the course. And of course, there are special modes like Ring Attack and connectivity with the GBA version for extra fun. Critics dug the game for its visuals and the variety it brought to the fairway, though some felt it didn't really break new ground compared to its predecessor. Still, it ended up on the Player's Choice roster in 2004, which uh, says a lot. <laughs> Mario Superstar Baseball Now we'll talk about something that's close to my heart. Mario Superstar Baseball This gem dropped for the GameCube in 2005, bringing the Mushroom Kingdom crew out of their usual adventures and onto the Baseball Diamond. Developed by Namco and part of that sweet lineup of Mario sports games, it really hit a home run with fans, especially with those who dug Mario Golf Toadstool Tour and Mario Power Tennis. This one's all about stepping up to the plate as your favorite Mario characters, each bringing their unique flair to the game. You're looking at a roster ready to swing for the fences in challenge mode, aiming to defeat Bowser's team and snag the cup. Besides the main dish, there are sides like exhibition mode for quick matches and mini games to sharpen those batting and pitching skills. The cool twist? A charged swing that sends the ball flying twice as hard and far. Plus, you can hook up with Mario Golf Advanced Tour via a cable for some cross-game fun. Critics and players both had a field day with the game's visuals and sound, praising the engaging courses and character variety. Yet, some folks thought it played it a bit safe, sticking too close to its N64 roots without bringing enough new stuff to the table. Despite that, it joined the ranks of Player's Choice by 2004, marking it as a fan favorite. What makes Mario Superstar Baseball so iconic is how you can choose your team captain and roster. Plus, the challenge modes add a layer of depth, making you think about which characters to recruit and when to unleash that powerful charged swing. Eternal Darkness Eternal Darkness is an action-adventure horror, developed by Silicon Knights and dropped by Nintendo for the GameCube in 2002, and it cranks the creep factor up to 11. It's like Nintendo decided to take a sharp left turn into the shadows, giving us something dark, dripping with Lovecraft vibes and a chilling narrative that spans two millennia and hops across four corners of the globe. The game's hook, Sanity Effects. Think that you're deep into the game, fighting ancient evils and suddenly your TV volume lowers on its own. The game pretends to delete your save. 
<laughs> it messes with you, breaking the fourth wall in ways that were mind-bending at the time. Developed first for the N64 before making the leap to the GameCube, it was a bold move by Nintendo, embracing a mature audience with its first game rated M by the ESRB. The gameplay mixes up exploration, puzzle-solving, and combat in a third-person perspective. You've got an in-game map, an inventory for your weapons and puzzle items, one of which you can enchant with magic for various effects, and a combat system that lets you lock onto enemies to target specific body parts. There's a roster of 12 characters you'll play as, each bringing their own strengths and weaknesses across different eras and locations. But here's where it gets really cool. Your choices early on influence which of the game's antagonists you're up against, and enemy placements throughout. Plus, there's this whole magic system that encourages spell experimentation, and the aforementioned sanity effects ramp up as your character's grip on reality loosens. Despite rave reviews from critics for its innovative mechanics and atmospheric storytelling, Eternal Darkness didn't hit it big on sales, moving under half a million copies globally. Baton Kaitos Baton Kaitos, Eternal Wings and the Lost Ocean Baton Kaitos, Eternal Wings and the Lost Ocean takes you on a role-playing adventure set across floating islands in the sky, where you're a guardian spirit guiding the protagonist, Kalas, and his band of companions. Developed by Monolith Soft and Tri Crescendo for the GameCube, this game is all about exploring a kingdom in the clouds and duking it out with an ancient evil using a deck of magical cards known as Magnus. So, the gameplay is wild, because these Magnus cards capture the essence of pretty much everything in the game's world. They're your inventory, your spells, your weapons, and even your food. The twist? Items in these cards can change over time, like milk turning into cheese, adding a whole new layer of strategy. The battles blend turn-based and action-packed fighting with a bit of collectible card game flavor. Imagine combining cucumber and honey cards mid-fight to whip up a honeydew melon card for a health boost. Ah. Plus, you're building decks for each character and playing cards in battles, aiming for combos that pack a punch. Despite being a breath of fresh air with its unique mechanics and stunning world, Baton Kaitos didn't exactly fly off the shelves, but it still earned enough love for a prequel to roll out toward the end of the GameCube's life. Though we haven't seen new titles since, the devs have hinted they'd be down to revisit the series if the chance popped up. Fast forward to 2023, and BAM! We got Baton Kaitos 1 and 2 HD Remaster on the Nintendo Switch, bringing this classic back into the limelight. Critics were all over the game's gorgeous visuals, enchanting music, and that wild card-based battle system. They dug the world's vibe, comparing it to flipping through through a fairy tale with moving clouds and swaying leaves. And that battle system? It's like nothing else out there, mixing strategy, action, and a bit of poker lock into something truly special. However, not everyone was sold on the voice acting or the story pacing. Plus, who doesn't want to get lost in a world where you can fly between islands in the sky and fight evil with a deck of magical cards? Star Fox Assault Star Fox Assault takes the whole Star Fox crew into this epic space opera where they're duking it out against these creepy bug-like machines called Aperoids. Developed by Namco and brought to us by Nintendo for the GameCube back in 2005, this game blends 3D shooting action with some on-the-ground third-person shootouts. Now, the plot's like something out of a sci-fi blockbuster. After the events of Star Fox Adventures, Fox McCloud and his squad are out to save the galaxy from the Aperoids, who are hell-bent on assimilating everything. There's betrayal, unexpected alliance, and a final showdown that's pretty much do or die to save the Lilac system. The music's a mix of orchestral vibes from Star Fox 64 and some new tracks just for Assault, giving it this grand cinematic feel. Gameplay split between tearing through the sky in your R-Wing, rolling around in the Landmaster tank, or just hoofing it on foot. The multiplayer mode lets you mess around with all three, but the choice of vehicle or boots on the ground depends on the map you're playing. And yeah, you can fly into an R-Wing or jump into a Landmaster mid-level, which is pretty cool. The big twist here is the Magnus cards. Wait, no, wrong game. Uh, uh, I meant the big twist in Assault is the gameplay diversity and how it shifts between flying and ground missions. Uh -huh. Plus, there's this arsenal of weapons you find scattered around when you're on foot from blasters to sniper rifles and even grenades. The reception was kinda mixed, with the game's on foot controls getting some flack for feeling a bit off. Multiplayer was fun, but didn't hook everyone for long. Despite that, fans dug the flexibility of hopping between the R-Wing and Landmaster, and the soundtrack got some major props for adding to the epic vibe. It did well enough to hit Nintendo player's choice, which is no small feat. Bomberman 
generation. Bomberman's back at it again, but this time he's on the GameCube, and he's not alone. This 2002 title throws Bomberman and a bunch of his Charabomb buddies into six worlds filled with puzzles, minigames, and some Pokemon-like battles that'll have you hooked. The plot? Well, it's Bomberman, so you know it's about saving the universe. This time it's from the Hige Hige bandits and their devious leader, Mujo, who were after these powerful bomb elements that crashed on the planet Tentacles. Bomberman's mission is to beat the baddies to the punch and secure the elements to keep the universe from going kaput. The gameplay? It's a mix of classic Bomberman action with a twist. You're running through levels, solving puzzles and duking it out with bosses, all while managing your Magnus cards and Cherubombs. Plus, the game looks slick with its cell shading style, giving it a vibrant, lively feel. Multiplayer is where Bomberman Generation really shines, though. You've got several modes to choose from, like the standard battle where you blow up your friends or something more strategic like Reverse Eye Battle. And you can unlock a bunch of stuff by either playing a ton of multiplayer games or smashing certain goals in the single-player campaign. Everyone around were pretty into it, praising its mix of old-school Bomberman gameplay with new mechanics, thanks to those Magnus cards. The game scored well across the board, even snagging a spot as the most underrated game of 2002 by Nintendo Power. Despite not setting the sales charts on fire, it did well enough to spawn a follow-up Bomberman Jettas. WWE Day of Reckoning 2 WWE Day of Reckoning 2 hit the GameCube scene back in 2005, flexing some serious wrestling muscle. Story-wise, it picks up post-Day of Reckoning, with your character knocked from Raw's top spot and trying to claw back up. There's drama, with Triple H, Chris Jericho, and a love interest twist featuring Stacey Keebler. Fast forward to WrestleMania 21, and there's a title grab up for stakes. But oops, <laughs> the belt's gone, MIA. Cue a whodunit that sees your character framed, dumped, and shunned to SmackDown. But hey hey, plot twist, it was all a setup by Jericho, Orton, and Edge. Your wrestler ends up WWE champ, buddies up with Triple H again, and snags back Stacy. The gameplay kept what fans dug about the first day of reckoning, like the momentum shift and lift, but then it went and tossed in this stamina meter to keep you on your toes. Wrestlers now get winded, slowing down as the match drags on, which adds a slice of strategy to your SmackDowns, and the bloodier your wrestler gets, the tougher it is to catch your breath. The submission system got a total overhaul, letting you choose from four stars to either taunt, rest, drain stamina, or just plain inflict pain. Character creation's back and beefier than ever. You get to craft your wrestler and load them up with up to nine finishes, tailored to smack down opponents from any angle. Though, bomber alert, you can't carry over your champ from the first game. Hmm, critics and gamers? Both were mostly into it, slapping it with a generally favorable tag on Metacritic. It had its ups and downs, with some reviewers not feeling the control scheme and others digging the deepened gameplay and richer story mode. IGN and GameZone were handing out high fives with scores and nodded to the game's upgrades and its polished ring action. Chibi Robo. This quirky little gem of a game that found its way onto the GameCube. <laughs> a tiny robot, no taller than a soda can, buzzing around a house trying to spread joy and mop up messes. That's Chibi Robo for you, a 10 centimeter tall bot with a mission to make everyone happy. Developed by Skip Limited and given a nudge by Nintendo's own Shigeru Miyamoto, Chibi Robo drops you into the shoes, or should I say, the metal feet of the smallest housekeeper around. The game's all about exploring a household, helping out the Sanderson family and their sentient toy companion all while managing your precious battery life. Because here's the kicker. Every little task you do, from cleaning up spills to lending an ear to toy dramas, drains your battery. Run low, and you'll need to scurry over to a wall socket faster than a cat spotting a cucumber. Mm -hmm. What made Chibi Robo stand out was how well platforming it was with a slice of life adventure, wrapped up in a premise that's as charming as it is unique. Critics gave it a thumbs up for its originality, storytelling, and the sheer novelty of playing as a pint-sized robot on a big-hearted mission. Though not everyone was was sold on the graphics, and some gameplay bits felt a bit clunky to a few. Despite the warm critical reception, Chibi Robo didn't exactly set the sales charts on fire. Still, it left enough of an impression to spawn a series, with sequels like Park Patrol and Photo Finder exploring new adventures for our tiny hero, from greening up parks to snapping photos for a museum. The series even ventured onto the DS and 3DS, keeping that unique blend of joy spreading and problem solving alive. Lost Kingdoms. Lost Kingdoms takes on a one-of-a-kind spin on the action RPG genre that hit the GameCube back in 2002, courtesy of From Software and Activision. You're in a world enveloped in a mysterious black fog that's swallowing towns, people, and basically any form of joy you can think of. Enter our hero, Katia, who's not your typical sword-swinging, spell-casting protagonist. Nope, she's a princess with a deck of magical cards up her sleeve. Katia's land, Argwil, is under siege by this black fog, and with her dad, the king, MIA, after trying to combat this 
Lynn's creeping doom, she decides it's her turn to step up, but here's where it gets cool. Katya's weapon of choice is a collection of these magical cards, powered by a runestone, which she uses to summon creatures and cast spells to fend off monsters birthed by the fog. The combat system is where Lost Kingdoms really stands out. Battles go down in real time, landing some nifty footwork and strategic card play. You're literally throwing cards down that spring to life and duke it out with whatever nightmare the fog throws your way. Plus, there's this neat multiplayer mode, where you can pit your deck against a friends in a magical showdown. In the game, cards come in different flavors, some are for brawling, others for healing, and then there are those that do special things like bring used cards back into play. The game throws in an elemental twist too, with cards wielding fire, water, wood, earth, and neutral powers, each with their own rock-paper-scissors hierarchy of strengths and weaknesses. Reviewers were into the whole card battle mechanic, finding it a fresh take on action RPGs. The multiplayer was a hit for deck-building duels among friends, yet not everyone was sold on the execution. The storyline was seen as a bit on the thin side, and the graphics and sound didn't exactly blow anyone away. Despite that, it snagged itself a sequel, Lost Kingdoms 2, continuing the card-casting adventures of Katya. Lost Kingdoms 2 hmm. Lost Kingdoms 2 is a game that stuck to its card-carrying roots while trying to shuffle in some new elements. Released in 2003 by From Software, this sequel takes us generations past the story of Katia from the first Lost Kingdoms. Now we've got a new lead, Tara Grimface, who's as tough as they come, partly because she's rocking a true runestone, enabling her to wield some seriously heavy-hitting magic cards. So Tara's part of this thieving crew known as the Band of the Scorpion, right? Hmm. They're all about nabbing runestones, and during one of their heists, Tara stumbles upon on this god of harmony turned monster runestone factory. As you do in these games, Tara's adventure digs deep into her past, hinting at some pretty intriguing mysteries about who she really is. Gameplay-wise, Lost Kingdoms 2 sticks to its guns, or cards, I should say. You're still duking it out in real-time battles using a deck of magical cards to summon creatures or cast spells. But here's the twist. The sequel throws in over 200 cards, including some from the first game but with tweaked effects, and introduces a dual effect system for summon cards, giving players more strategic flexibility. Ability. There's also this new mechanical element that neither buffs nor debuffs against other elements, adding another layer to deck building. Another cool feature? Well, you can supercharge any card by doubling its cost for an enhanced effect, which can be a game changer in tight spots. And if you're feeling really adventurous, there are specific card combos that morph into a super powerful effect, perfect for those oh no moments in battle. Now, the reception was a mixed bag. On one side, you've got Game Informer and RPG fan giving it props, appreciating the improvements and depth added to the card mechanics. On the flip side, Edge and IGN were less impressed, pointing out that despite these new features, the game didn't quite hit the highs it aimed for. The critics were split, much like a deck of cards, some seeing a winning hand while others felt it was a bit of a bluff. WWE WrestleMania XIX WWE WrestleMania XIX hit the GameCube in 2003, right smack in the transition from the Attitude Era to the Ruthless Aggression Era, with a roster boasting around 69 WWE superstars. But here's the twist. Instead of the usual climb the ranks career mode we've come to expect from wrestling games, WrestleMania XIX throws players into revenge mode. Think that you've just been booted out of the arena, your dreams shattered and ego bruised, only to bump into Stephanie McMahon. She's got this one idea to take down Vince McMahon and ruin WrestleMania, and you're just the disgruntled ex-employee to help her do it. So you embark on this off-the-wall mission that takes you from brawling on construction sites to sinking WWE barges and even causing chaos in a mall. It's like WWE meets mission-based action, and it's as bonkers as it sounds. Your end goal? Well, get back at Vince by taking him down at WrestleMania XIX. Win, and you get a congratulatory spear from Goldberg, because <laughs> why not? And then Stephanie turns into cash because, well, again, why not? Critics seem to dig the game's departure from the norm, with Metacritic summing it up to a generally favorable consensus. IGN was particularly impressed, slapping an 8 out of 10 on it and probably enjoying the wild ride revenge mode of it. GameSpot and GameZone also tossed in their approval with scores around the 7.5 to 7.8 range, while Nintendo Power and Nintendo World Report were feeling generous with a solid 4 out of 5 and 8 out of 10, respectively.
Warrior World, Warrior World, released for the GameCube, flips the script by casting the typically villainous Wario in the lead role. Developed by Treasure and released in the early 2000s, it's a platform adventure where Wario is on a mission to reclaim his castle and treasure from the clutches of the evil Black Jewel. The plot kicks off with Wario basking in his glorious treasure-stuffed castle, only for the Black Jewel to wreak havoc, transforming his horde into monsters and his castle into fragmented worlds. Wario's quest spans across Excitement Central, Spooktastic World, Thrillsville, and Sparkle Land, each ending with a boss battle. Depending on how many Spritelings Wario rescues, the ending varies from a meager campsite to a lavish new palace. Gameplay-wise, Wario World is a blend of brawling and platforming. Wario packs a punch, literally, with his combat moves including grabbing, spinning, and pile-driving enemies into oblivion. Plus, with every smackdown, enemies drop coins. Wario's lifeblood, since they're not just for scoring, but crucial for reviving him when things go sound. The game introduces neat features like glue globes for sticking Wario to reach new heights, and the Spritelings that dish out advice and backstory. Levels are linear, with a mix of puzzles and platforming challenges, where progression hinges on snagging red diamonds. While Metacritic scores hover around 71, with publications like Game Informer and IGN praising its mechanics and level design, others like GameSpot and GameSpy knocked it for brevity and lack of depth. Despite this, it managed respectable sales in Japan and the US, earning it a spot in the player's choice lineup. WarioWare Inc. Mega Party Games WarioWare Inc. Mega Party Games is a party game for the GameCube that's basically a pumped-up version of WarioWare Inc. Mega Micro Games. The game doesn't have a deep plot, it's Wario doing Wario things, being his greedy self, looking to make a fortune by creating a game console full of wacky micro games. The real star here is the chaotic, fast-paced gameplay that grabs you and your friends for some hilarious couch gaming sessions. Coming to the gameplay now, imagine trying to tackle rapid-fire minigames that switch up every few seconds. That's Mega party games. In a nutshell, it carries over all the original micro games from Mega Micro Games but twists them into a multiplayer extravaganza. Whether you're avoiding a bursting balloon in Balloon Bang, trying not to be the one failing a game in Survival Fever, acting out instructions in Listen to the Doctor, or balancing a stack of turtles in Wobbly Bobbly, there's endless fun. It's designed to keep you on your toes, laughing and shouting at the screen with up to four players. When it hit the scene, Mega Party Games was pretty well received, mainly for how it turned solo micro game madness into a party. Critics loved the multiplayer aspect, but were a bit meh about the game reusing content from its predecessor. On the whole, though, it landed a decent score of around 77% on game rankings, showing that a lot of folk had a good time with it. It even got a nod for Console Family Game of the Year at the 8th Annual Interactive Achievement Awards, which says a lot about its appeal. It was a trailblazer for introducing multiplayer to the WarioWare series, setting the stage for future titles to include more group fun. The variety and sheer unpredictability of the micro games makes every play session a new experience. Plus, it's Wario at his finest, greedy, funny, and a bit of a genius for creating such an addictive game formula. Battalion Wars Battalion Wars is this real-time tactics game from 2005 for the GameCube that's pretty rad. Developed by Kuju London and published by Nintendo, it's like a mix of strategy and action where you're commanding troops across battlefields, from infantry and tanks to aircraft. Let me break it down for you. The game sets you up as this commander of a battalion caught up in a conflict between two nations. Just when things seem straightforward, BAM! A third nation jumps in with a surprise attack, forcing the first two to team up against this new threat. It's all about alliances, betrayal, and warfare, with a setting that spans across diverse terrains and nations inspired by real-world powers and some fantastical elements like vampires and mystical empires. The story's got enough twists to keep you guessing and engaged. Dude. The gameplay is where it's at. It's single-player heaven, with a mix of real-time tactics and third-person shooting. You're in charge of an entire battalion, maneuvering units across the battlefield, capturing points, and blasting away enemies. The game gives you a variety of units to play with, and you've got to use them wisely to complete objectives and earn those high ranks. It's like being a general and a soldier all at once, with controls that let you jump into the action or command from above. The game's got this perfect balance of strategy and hands-on combat that's super engaging. Sure, some reviewers were weren't fans of the clunky controls and the lack of multiplayer, but overall it scored well, like around 76 out of 100 on Metacritic. It was well liked enough to spawn a sequel on the Wii, which is pretty cool. Plus, the focus on single-player campaign means you get a fully fleshed-out experience, exploring into strategy without worrying about online trolls.
1080 degree avalanche. 1080 degree avalanche on the GameCube. <laughs> Absolute jam. Okay, so 1080 avalanche isn't about a deep story or anything. It's snowboarding, pure and simple. You're racing down mountains, trying to be the fastest, and occasionally outrunning avalanches that are more intense than deciding what to watch on Netflix on a Friday night. The gameplay sticks to the roots of the original. It's you against the mountain, and sometimes you're literally racing an avalanche in the game's most heart-pounding moments. The game's got over 20 courses and different modes like match, trick attack, and time trial to keep things spicy. Plus, each rider has their own unique boards, and you can unlock even more, including some wacky bonus boards like a penguin or an NES controller. How cool is that? And get this, if you're feeling social, you can have up to four players on one GameCube or even get a LAN party going with multiple consoles. Imagine the chaos of snowboarding with your buddies or trying not to get swallowed by a virtual avalanche. So, the critics were again kind of mixed but generally positive. The game scored around the 73 to 75 out of 100 mark on Metacritic and game rankings. Reviews pointed out that while the game is solid, it might not stack up against the giants like SSX3, especially when it comes to the trick system. Some reviewers, like Dan Su from EGM, weren't thrilled with the tricks, and Sean Elliott had some strong words about its comparison to SX3. But hey, if racing down a mountain with the threat of being buried alive by snow sounds fun, this might be your jam. Super Monkey Ball 2 – Ready to go bananas? Super Monkey Ball 2 is the sequel to the original Super Monkey Ball, and the first in the series to actually have a storyline. Plus, it was exclusively released on a home console. Fast forward, and its stages even got a revamp in Super Monkey Ball Banana Mania. So, the game starts off with this evil scientist, Dr. Bad Boon, who nabs all the bananas from Monkey Island. Classic villain move, right? This sets our heroes, Ai Ai, Mimi, Gon Gon, and Baby, on a wild chase through Dr. Bad Boon's booby trap stages to get those bananas back. The story unfolds over 100 levels across 10 worlds, with some quirky animated cutscenes to tie it all together. Gameplay-wise, it sticks to its Marble Madness-esque roots. You're controlling a monkey inside a ball, navigating through mazes filled with obstacles and trying to beat the clock without falling off. But this sequel ups the ante with more complex paths that loop, spin, and corkscrew, plus stages that move in all directions. It's got a spiked difficulty curve, thanks to new design elements like looped paths with obstacles and stages with pillars that pop out of nowhere. Also, there are switches to hit that play with the stage mechanics, adding a layer of strategy and puzzle solving to the mix. The single player story mode groups levels by 10, offering infinite lives to complete each world's stages in any order. And for those who love a challenge, there's a challenge mode with different difficulty levels and even master stages for the hardcore players. Now, the multiplayer is where it gets real fun. There are 12 mini games, including classics from the first game and six new additions. You've got everything from monkey race with new weapons to monkey bowling with special non linear lanes and even some Virtua franchise replicas like Monkey Tennis and Monkey Baseball. The variety here is insane, making it a blast to play with friends, despite the plot being a bit out there. The overall gameplay, especially in multiplayer, was praised for its depth and replay value. Plus, the game's aesthetics, from the animated backgrounds to the upbeat techno music, got a thumbs up for adding vibrancy to the experience. Odama. Next, we have Odama for the GameCube. Developed by Vivarium and dropped by Nintendo in 2006, it's the brainchild of the same genius behind Seaman, Yutaka Sato. It's one of the last hurrahs for the GameCube, right before The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess hit the scene. So, you're in feudal Japan, stepping into the geta of Yamanuchi Kagetora. This young general is on a vengeance quest after his dad gets betrayed and offs himself to avoid disgrace. Kagetora is rocking the battlefield with the Odama, this colossal ball that's part pinball, part weapon of mass destruction. His goal? Crush the traitor Karasuma Genshin and uphold the way of Nintendo, a philosophy of unity and honor. Gameplay-wise, this is like if pinball and tactical wargaming had a baby. You're smacking this giant Odama with flippers, trying to take out enemy lines and bust open gates while keeping your troops from getting squished. The game throws in a twist with the GameCube microphone, letting you shout commands to your soldiers to dodge the Odama or charge the enemy. It's hectic, strategic, and totally bonkers, with 11 different voice commands to boss your army around. Now, let's take a peek at the reception. Reviews were all over the map, with Metacritic tagging it at a 62 out of 100. Some folks thought it was brilliant, others, hmm, not so much. The Mitsu from Japan was feeling it more, scoring at a solid 31 out of 40. But regardless of where the scores landed, Odama snagged IGN's most innovative design for a GameCube game in 2006. It's clear this game wasn't for everyone, but it turned heads with its off-the-wall concept.
Beyblade Super Tournament Battle What have we got next? Beyblade Super Tournament Battle It's this Beyblade game from 2002, right in the thick of the Beyblade 5-4 season hype. It hit Japan first and then made its way to the West in 2003. It's got this RPG twist where you dive into tournaments, picking your Beyblade and Blader to battle it out for glory, and of course, better gear. So you get into these tournaments where you choose your Beyblade, aim for the perfect launch, and if you nail it, your Beyblade spins faster and harder. You rack up points by stopping your opponent's spin or launching yours without a hitch. And here's where it gets juicy. Smash your opponent's Beyblade to bits and you earn a whopping 4 points, thanks to unleashing your Bit Beast. That's when the game turns epic. Bit Beast attacks not only deal more damage, but also speed up your spin. You're battling it out against the computer or your friends, trying to earn legend power points by hitting other Beyblades to unleash your beast. <laughs> Sounds fun, right? Well, hold on to your launcher because the critics weren't exactly fans. The game's scores were, well, let's just say, less than stellar. Game rankings gave it a 47.11% and Metacritic sitting at a chilly 33%. <laughs> IGN was particularly harsh, dropping a 2.5 out of 10 and pretty much saying the game missed its mark by a mile. They argued that the simple concept didn't translate well into a video game, especially one that wasn't well executed. Ooh. <laughs> Naruto Clash of Ninja Naruto Clash of Ninja is like stepping right into the anime. Developed by Aiting and dished out by D3 Publisher and Tomy, these games kicked off on the GameCube and eventually made their way to the Wii, too. The games are all about throwing down with your favorite Naruto characters, from the early days of Naruto himself to the intense Shippuden arcs. The plot usually follows the anime, so I expect a lot of familiar faces and storylines, especially in story modes that dive deep into the Naruto universe. Gameplay is what you'd expect from a fighting game, but with a Naruto twist. You pick your ninja and use their unique jutsus to battle it out, trying to knock out your opponent's health bar. Special techniques can drain your chakra bar, so there's a bit of strategy involved when to go all out and when to hold back. The series is known for its simple, easy-to-learn controls, which get a bit more nuanced with each new game. And with modes ranging from story to versus, there's enough to keep you hooked. This series had a rocky start with mixed reviews, but as it evolved, it gained more love for its engaging gameplay and fidelity to the Naruto series. Still, some folks wished for more content and depth in the fighting mechanics. Each game added more characters and storylines, closely following the anime's progression, which means the character roster got pretty impressive over time. The introduction of Shippuden characters in later games took things up with new designs and abilities, reflecting their growth in the series. Despite the criticism for its simplicity and sometimes repetitive gameplay, the Clash of Ninja series holds a special place for Naruto fans. NBA Courtside 2002 NBA Courtside 2002 was developed by Left Field Productions and released by Nintendo for the GameCube in 2002. It's the third slice of the NBA Courtside pie and follows up from the Kobe Bryant-featured N64 installment. The game rolls deep with every player from the 2001-2002 season, all kitted out with their unique stats, giving it that real NBA vibe. You've got your standard season and arcade modes to mess around in, plus you can get all hands-on by customizing your team and players. Whether it's tweaking stats or renaming your squad's faces, it's all in your hands. There's even a practice mode to sharpen those skills and a competitive mode to test your metal against other teams. Critics gave it a mix of nods and shakes, landing it at an average score on Metacritic. Yet it managed to charm with its depth, and Eurogamer even went as far as to say it outclassed NBA Live 2002, calling it a better simulation with an arcade mode that could throw punches with NBA Street. Praise was thrown at the graphics, gameplay, and particularly the sound effects, making you feel like you're right in the game. However, not everything was a slam dunk, with some gripes about the AI and the skills mode not being all that. Although it got some mixed bag of reviews, it actually sold over 120,000 copies, proving it had game. It stood out for its depth, solid simulation aspects, and for offering a pretty neat alternative to the other basketball games out there. Home Run King Home Run King was developed for the GameCube, and it's all about the thrill of batting and pitching without getting bogged down by the complex parts of baseball, like fielding. The game keeps it simple, pitch, hit, and run. Whether you're looking to play through a season, take on the playoffs, or just smash some homers in the Home Run Derby, Home Run King has got you covered. The controls are super intuitive, so you won't need a manual the size of a phone book just to play. And for those moments when you're feeling a bit creative, there's a Create a Player feature that lets you design your own baseball superstar from scratch. While I don't have the exact numbers on 
how it was received, the focus on pitching and hitting over fielding, plus the easy to pick up gameplay likely scored points with players looking for a more arcade style baseball experience. The game's timing, dropping just as the 2002 MLB season was getting started, also meant it was perfectly positioned for fans itching for some baseball action. The fact that it includes all the real teams and players from the MLB makes it even cooler, offering that authentic vibe without the complexity. Knockout Kings. Knockout Kings. Knockout Kings series comes a bunch of boxing video games that EA Sports pumps out yearly from 1998 to 2003. This series was all about stepping into the ring without having to leave your couch, throwing punches with some of the greatest names in boxing. Well, storyline per se might be a stretch, since we're talking about sports games here. Hmm, but the gist? Well, you pick a legendary boxer or create your own, climb up the ranks and aim to become the ultimate champ. From training in the gym to duking it out in iconic arenas, it's all about the sweet science of boxing. This series lets you dive into the boxing world, offering modes like career, where you'll build your boxer's legacy and exhibition for quick matches. The gameplay is pretty straightforward for a fighting game. Think punches, dodge and special moves, with each boxer bringing their unique style to the ring. Early on, the graphics and mechanics were basic, but with each new installment, EA dialed up the realism, adding facial injuries, mouthpiece flying and even boxers making their grand entrance to the ring. The series had its ups and downs in the eyes of gamers and critics. While some editions like Knockout Kings 2001 were hailed as the best boxing games of the time, others faced criticism for various aspects, from AI to gameplay depth. Despite the mixed reviews, these games were a hit among boxing fans and gamers looking for a solid sports fighting experience. Verdict. Wow, what a ride! We just wrapped up our most criminally overlooked GameCube games that are practically screaming for a comeback. I gotta say, going through this list was like reopening a time capsule filled with all the quirky, unique, and downright innovative gems that made the GameCube the unforgettable console it was. Despite its quirky purple exterior and those tiny discs that became the butt of so many jokes, the GameCube held its own with a library that was nothing short of magical. It's kinda wild to think that some of these games didn't get the love they deserved back in the day, but hey, <laughs> that's what we're here for to shine a spotlight on these hidden masterpieces and dream about what it'd be like to see them revived on today's platforms. It's hard not to get a bit sentimental when you think about it. The GameCube wasn't just a console, it was a gateway to worlds that felt both expansive and intensely personal, all packed into a little cube with a handle. And let's not forget that controller. <laughs> yeah, it looked a bit odd, but uh, man, did it feel good in your hands. So, what's the takeaway from our nostalgia fueled journey? It's simple, the GameCube's legacy is far from over. There's a whole treasure trove of games that deserve a second shot and deserve to be discovered by new audiences and rekindled in the hearts of those who played them years ago. Well, that's it for today and we'll see you soon with a banger new episode. Make sure to hit that like button and comment down if we missed any GameCube gem that you were a diehard fan of. <laughs> Until next time, fellas.